Hi everyone, time for another repair video here. Um, this time I've got a Stanford Research Systems uh, model SR650. It's a dual channel programmable filter here. Um, okay, so why did I get one of these? Well, actually it was off the back of the EEV blog where Dave there um, bought a faulty one uh, off of eBay and uh, got it up and running and it just so happened it rang a little bell with me because uh, during the actual uh, design and build and testing of my own uh, bench power supply there I uh, was at the time looking to get rid of some uh, noise uh, from the switch mode power supply and I was actually mucking about building little filters and that sort of thing as I was trying to troubleshoot that and then when I saw Dave's video on the SR650 I thought wow it's exactly what I'm needing a little programmable filter I can uh, do the high pass and the low pass and build a little band pass uh, filter out of it all that sort of thing so I uh, did a little research on uh, eBay and I came across this rather sorry looking SR650 um, and as you can see it's uh, been through the wars really it's obviously had a great big uh, um, dent on top there something heavy and uh, it is really looking rather sorry for itself in terms of corrosion and just the general state on the output anyway. So um, oh, I just went ahead for all the costs, I just went ahead and purchased it. Um, wasn't really that much so I just thought it'd be great to get it up and running a little wee project to uh, be getting on with. So we'll just start off by taking a look around the unit itself. Like I said it's had some sort of uh, something heavy landing on top of it there it actually dented the the top of the case in rather heavily there and it does seem to have had a, a bit of an impact on the, this display anyway um, because the actual eBay ad itself showed that uh, this particular LED whilst it powered up uh, there was missing segments and all the rest of it but we'll come to that when we get inside just taking a look around the outside of it you'll see there's some rather corroded screws uh, on the side there um, and moving on to the front here you can see that the display I don't know if you can pick it up in the video but it's pretty bad looking there and what that actually is um, you know when you buy uh, uh, new equipment with displays either LED or LCD there's a, a scratch resistant film usually across the front of the displays that you're meant to peel off before you start actually using the device well these two displays here had that film still across it and obviously nobody over the years has actually pulled it off and it had gone all hard and brittle I've pulled most of it off at the moment because uh, it kind of fell away it crumbled away but you can see there's still some residue left so it's not actually the display itself it's just the film that's gone all hard and stuck onto the, the front of the display there so I will have to play about with that and see if I can remove that. There's nothing actually scratched or anything so it's not too bad. Um, BNC's don't look in too bad a shape. Um, Dave's on the EEV blog, his were rather corroded there. Um, I don't know why mine aren't uh, considering that the screws on the side are pretty corroded but uh, I think I've gotten away with the BNC's being in rather good shape there. Um, I haven't actually powered it up yet but I do know that some of the push buttons will need work. Um, some of them do actually click uh, when you actually press them but some of them like this one here it's actually dead it hardly presses in at all so it's probably all gummed up and uh, or possibly even corroded there so I will have to um, probably replace the switches or clean them out or something like that but some of them do appear to, to, to work to feel as if they're working okay at least they seem to click under the finger anyway there so that doesn't look too bad there so moving around the back I'll just turn it around here uh, again it's uh, you know it's it's been pretty corroded I mean I don't know where this thing's been sitting this 25 way D type here is just in a, a bit of a mess there and I suspect the pins inside are probably in a, a similar state the uh, GPBIB um, socket here it doesn't look too bad although the hex nuts there are uh, pretty uh, you know corroded as well but you know other than that it isn't that bad at all and of course I've got the AC input there and the fuse uh, on the back there so pulling the cover off obviously um, with the state of the outside and the corrosion on it there and the bad shape I always uh, 
wasn't really looking that much forward to opening it up and see what kind of state the inside was in. However, I think I'm rather pleasantly surprised really. Um, the PCBs, you know, they're a little bit dusty but they don't look in too bad a shape there. If I just zoom in and go over, you know, some of the circuitry here, you can see that there's, you know, there's little corrosion, if any, any. The, I mean, the, only, the worst I've really got is the, um, basically the, the, the film on the outside of the capacitors where, you know, where the, the value and all that's printed has basically come away, but, you know, I suspect that the capacitor's all right. It's been, and basically all of these, uh, capacitors in a similar state, it's just the, the glue's dried up and basically the films come away there. So that, that's about the worst I've got there. Um, two PCBs inside of this unit here, it's been, been a dual channel uh, device, both identical PCBs. Nothing really looks damaged at all on it. You've got the two analog boards here, one for each channel, and you've got the, the processor board at the back there and the power supply here. Um, one of the things that attracted me to this unit here is actually that it's uh, Z80 powered. Um, my background from you know the the mid to late 80s, early 90s was all Z80 stuff. So I quite like the fact that it's actually Z80 driven there. Um, as you can see, there's a little bit of corrosion uh, down in the back of the 25-way D-type. It's just come through from the outside, so probably a little bit of a clean up there required just to to stop it from spreading any further. Um, moving round to the back of the display board, this is the, this is a corner here that got the heavy impact, and as you can see, um, this is uh, the display header here. As you can see, the connector is almost uh, it's almost off. I haven't touched this as yet. I haven't tried to push it back on, and you can see that the the pins are bent. This is a right angled connector. It's meant to come out horizontally here. As you can see, it's had a fair old whack pushing it down. So that's probably why the display in the front, uh, uh, you know, um, not working too great. So other than that, uh, nothing else seems to have taken too bad a hit. I haven't actually pulled back the ribbon cables here to see if the board's been damaged at all, but uh, just from what I can see from this position here, it doesn't look as if it's uh, been hit at all. You can see the clip there for the where the connector should be sitting, so I think it'll just be a pretty easy case of bending those pins back up. Um, Hopefully there's been no uh, damage to the actual circuit board, that, like i.e. the pins ripped out of the, the, the through hole there, but uh, it doesn't look like it from this position, uh, it just looks like it's just had a fair old whack from the top and that's that. So just a quick look on the processor board itself, starting at the far right hand side here you've got a uh, uh, RAM chip there, you've got uh, looks to be a, an OTP EEPROM there, a 27C256 and then an actual EEPROM itself, so obviously the memory, the, the ROM is split across these two here. Um, then you've got this actual Z80 itself with the uh, address buffers etc et here and then you've got a GPBIB uh, IC here, that's obviously the socket at the back there and over on this side here, this is a serial port at the back there, the 25 way D type so you've got a, a UART here, um, the Z80 doesn't have any built in serial ports as such therefore external UART here and then obviously just a few buffer chips there um, buffering the data in and out, uh, probably this ribbon cable here going away off to the display etc. Uh, and also onto the main analog boards here. Um, one thing to note, there is one IC in a socket here and that's actually a, 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 a 748C04 um, and I think I know probably why that's been socketed. It's the only socketed board chip on the board apart from the ROMs and the RAM which you would normally socket anyway. So this is the crystal here, probably for the Z80 itself, it's probably something like a 6.144 MHz crystal, I haven't actually had a look at it in any detail to see exactly what it is. And the easiest way back in the day to utilise one of these crystals is you wouldn't actually tie it directly to the Z80 itself like you would do in most microcontrollers nowadays, you actually have to build a little external oscillating circuit. And the easiest way to do that back in the day was just using a 748C04 or an, or an LS04. Now I remember back in the day that uh, there were certain uh, brands of ICs or batches that wouldn't oscillate properly, they would double oscillate, they would give some sort of echo signal and they wouldn't give a nice clean signal. 
uh, uh, out to the Z80 so we'd quite often have to maybe drop in a couple of replacements and, and try and find one that was good whenever we were building new boards so I kind of suspect that's why this has been socketed for exactly that reason so they can play about with them um, uh, just to get one that oscillated nicely and um, sometimes on power up they wouldn't start up properly it wouldn't oscillate properly in power up and you'd have to reset the board a couple of times before you got it going so hence uh, like I said this is in a socket there um, so moving on to the power supply here everything looks in good shape it doesn't look like the capacitors are um, bulging at all or there's any uh, failure pending on any of them there um, transform in the corner there the heat sinks in place got the um, regulators bolted down on it there. I've got the other regulators here for the for the analog section there. They look all intact. The fans turns behind. It doesn't look too bad. So the first thing to do before I actually do any refurb on it or anything like that, I'm going to actually get it powered up. It was powered up on the eBay ad, so I don't really have a problem with actually sticking power into it and see what actually happens. Uh, um, of course I'll check the voltage selection on the back there, get her powered up, maybe the first thing I'll do is bend the pins on the uh, display header here just to see if I can bring up this uh, display here. But like I said, we'll power it up exactly as it is and see what we've got. Okay, before I actually go and put power into this unit, um, because I've bought it from a foreign country, it's not come from internally here in the UK, I want to double check the voltage selection on the back there. So obviously this is the IEC connector on the back here, and you've got a little slide cover here, uh, and this is where the fuse is. However, the, the voltage selection um, is actually done with a little insertable PCB here, so if I just prise it out there on camera, you can see this is the, the, the small card here and basically you just insert it whichever way around depending on what voltage you want. Now I don't have the manual to the unit by hand but I suspect that um, you insert it in the direction that you are reading the text i.e. if you want 240 volt you insert it this way if you want 120 volt you put it in that way if you want and you can turn it over you've got 220 volt and then 100 volt so I really want to double check that before I actually put power into it, um, that that is actually the case there. Now I received a unit with it inserted this way and that is actually what appears to be selected for 240 volts. So we're gonna, I'm going to go through a little process here to, to, to actually check that out. Uh, as it's a linear power supply and it's just a simple transformer uh, uh, on, on the AC primary side, it's pretty easy to check there. So let's go and do that now. So I'll plug this in on what I think is the 240 volt set in there. So here we go, plug it in there and then next thing I'll do is I'll actually slide the cover back over and I'll put my meter across the AC input there and you can see that we're getting about 51 ohms or so with the powers on in the back of the unit so I'm getting uh, the switches plugged, uh, pushed in in the front of the unit so it's all in circuit there. So I'm getting 51 ohms so I'll remove the PCB again and we'll turn it round to the 120 volt set in there oh. back in put this across again 14 ohms and that's about right the, the lower the AC voltage coming in I'd expect to see that drop there um, so that's fine so the next thing to do is just play about with the, all the uh, the basically the, the orientations of this, the permutations of inserting this, which you know there's obviously four different ways it can go in. And because I'm wanting 240 volt, which is the highest voltage um, attainable uh, on the selection, I really want the highest resistance I can measure across the AC input. So I've just done that, and in actual fact it is when it's inserted this way. Uh, probably my guess is right that uh, you insert it the way you can actually read the text there. So looks like this unit was already powered up uh, set for 240. Okay, I'm hooked up the mains AC input there. Uh, I've got it plugged into the wall and it's switched on. So now I'll just need to hit the power switch in the front and we'll, we'll see what happens there. And that looking good. That's more or less exactly how it was displayed on the actual uh, photograph on eBay there. 
this one appears to be working okay and of course this one here is just random segments there uh, but moving inside the fan in the back of the unit is actually um, working so that's not looking too bad there uh, of course uh, don't know the state of anything else but uh, we'll obviously get to that I think the the first thing to do is uh, actually try and see if I can um, bend the header back into place there and see if I can get that display up and running. Okay first thing I'm going to do is try and bend the pins. So I've pulled the header actually away and looking at the pins there, I don't know if you can see that, but one of the pins looks to be a good bit longer than the other one so I suspect that one might have been pulled out of the PCB there. Um, with a bit of luck, once I actually get inside it, that might be an actual unused uh, pad hopefully on the PCB so otherwise they'll have a little bit of a repair job to do there so the first thing to do first is to actually try and bend the pins straight again a little bit awkward to get into it's just a case of going along the, the pins one by one I didn't just want to grab the header and uh, try and bend it straight I wanted to uh, you know I don't want to do any more damage than what's already been done um, so it's probably best just to actually bend the pins one by one and I'm flying along them here anyway, so on the top set there, that's that long one that I might need to do something with and I'm just doing the top row first there's the header itself, doesn't look to be damaged at all and we'll just try plugging it in again not going all the way in probably because of that long pin is not helping but uh, I might have enough there at the moment until I can work out later on what's actually causing that long pin but we should, I should have it in far enough that it's got good contact onto all of the pins and therefore hopefully the display will start working and then switch it back on at the wall and then we'll try this again voila that's looking good, so I'll just give it a little wiggle at the back there. Now there's definitely, when I'm moving the header slightly up and down, you can see that this, uh, the input mode there, ACDC, is flicking back and forward, so there's definitely something still making and breaking on that header. Um, obviously, this, the pins that were relevant to the display look okay, however, some of the other pins and connections for the actual switches look like uh, they're making and breaking as well so I'm gonna have to take the bezel off anyway to, to clean it up etc so at that point there I'll get right into the back of the header and probably have a look at the that long pin and perhaps see if any of the other tr tracks etc around the pins have maybe been broken uh, as a result of the the, the the heavy impact in the top there but other than that we'll look to have a, a good display anyway so next thing bezel off Okay, I've removed the corroded screws from the top and the bottom there, they came out okay. So now it's just a case of pulling off this bezel. That's it there. And that should be that should be pretty easy to clean up. Real. It's just a, a metal bezel there, easy to clean that up and spray it. It's a little bit twisted, um, so I will need to twist it a little bit to get it straight again. Uh, but uh, that's fine. And then looking on the actual uh, front panel itself there's four screws from the back there um, which actually hold it in place there's uh, four pillars there so it looks like I'll have to remove them this end here looks to have had a little bit of a bash the pillars not actually dead straight in line with the case it's actually twisted slightly just the top one there okay I've removed the four screws that hold on the front panel I've desoldered all the input uh, wires onto the BNC's which were obviously stopping the front panel coming off so I think I've got everything off there now so I should be able to pull yep and that's the that's the actual front panel removed as you can see there so a good a good access now onto the actual uh, back of the, the board here so a little bit of a close up here on the actual bent header as you can see there those my, those all my straightened pins now you can actually see down inside it in there as well so I've obviously got uh, a little bit of a tidy up to do there there's a few screws to hold on the actual front panel to the to, 
to the PCB itself so I'll remove that, I've got good access to the other side and I'll be able to repair the, the, the push buttons as necessary uh, replace them if required uh, hopefully they're easy enough to get a hold of um, and easy enough to attach the caps back onto the actual switch themselves because sometimes in these this sort of units here they can be a little bit bespoke as I found out with my Raycal Dana in 1991 um, buttons on the front of it as well it was a similar story and I had to make up something to fit so hopefully I don't have to do that in this case it should just be a case of uh, hopefully replacing the, the switches and putting the new buttons on the caps on the front so we'll see how we get on with that so as you can see I've actually removed the bottom cover itself as well and uh, probably a good job I did, you can see there's um, some sort of corrosion going on in there in the corner there there was obviously a bit of moisture has gotten in and it's actually you know, started to corrode, that's actually below the power supply area so I'll take, take a good look at that and find out the reason why and here it is, there's the underside of the, the actual unit itself um, a little bit flimsy without the front panel as you can see there so I think the best way to actually hold it in place without putting too much stress on the PCBs is up on its side as you can see there when obviously when I put it flat down the boards are actually stressing you know either way um, but they're, they're mounted fairly well at this end here so I think this is the best way to orientate it uh, just for you know while I'm, while I'm working and everything else now as you can see down at the corner here like I showed you on the cover uh, basically moisture has gotten in and it's actually the, it's the bottom of the transformer there that's corroded so a little bit of a clean up there to, to, to go on I don't think I need to actually remove the PCBs at all um, these spars that go across here that support the PCBs they're in good shape I mean uh, there's no corrosion at all there uh, they look not too bad as is basically the bottom of the the PCBs the processor and power supply board there and actually the actual two analog boards they don't look in too bad a shape at all I'll just take some alcohol and give them a little bit of a clean up um, before I actually stick it back together again and as you can see there's a couple of a couple of bodges uh, there uh, from the factory basically a couple of a resistor and a diode there and a little bodge there and obviously this similar thing going on there on that one there and this one this one here's actually got a bodge interestingly that the other board doesn't so I just wonder if that was a, a problem possibly on the actual PCB itself that uh, a broken track or something like that because um, there's no reason I don't think why you wouldn't uh, do the same mod on both boards if it was a design fault something like that so uh, that's allowed we'll give them that there's no problem there um, yep yeah. so I'll put this to one side because I think the priority for me at the moment is to work in the front panel. Okay, and here's the actual front panel PCB completely exposed. Um, I've actually had a little bit of a luck here. Uh, when I actually removed it from the actual front panel uh, itself, uh, actually looking at some of the push buttons themselves, each and every single one of them actually is clicking rather nicely. It's not, I've not got that dead feeling or uh, you know where it where it was when it was actually bolted up onto the actual uh, front panel cover itself, and the reason for that is I think with the you know the the heavy impact that the unit took, I think it basically um, shifted the front panel out of place in respect to the PCB, so it was putting a lot of stress on the sides of the switches, and therefore they weren't able to actually depress properly. Uh, and basically in free air like you know they should do they're basically squashed up against the sides or some of them were on the panel there so I think I've hit a bit of luck there and probably the switches are all okay however looking at them they've probably been easy enough to get if I had a need to replace them because um, they just look like more or less standard uh, uh, push button switches there PCB mount with the four pins on the back there so um, looking at all of them um, they do, do appear to be okay um, so back onto the header itself there, as you can actually see the long pin here, it's actually um, doesn't look like it's actually been pulled through um, from the other side because the solder is not broken, it looks like it's been soldered in place that way um, which I'm not really too sure about, I mean you know 
generally in some connectors, you, you know, nowadays you will have a long pin and that's basically to ensure that the first pin that t takes contact when you push it in is the the ground connection so but I doubt that anyone's gone to that uh, kind of trouble with these sort of headers they're not designed for that so you know um, I will actually go and you know desolder that pin there and push it back through and at the same time there I'll take a look at the connections down onto this switch here uh, this is the one that seemed to be a little bit dodgy when I was moving the header back and forward so I will have to check all the now the PCB connections underneath there, you can see the pins underneath there, resolder them, check for any breaks etc and make sure that they're all okay uh, from the, the back of this switch here. Okay so what I've gone ahead and done is I've uh, pulled through the long pin there on the back of the on the header there, um, resoldered all the joints on the actual other side, on the solder side of the header there nothing appeared to be broken on this side anyway uh, but looking at this side of the board there is quite a number of uh, uh, tracks come off of the pins underneath the header and at the moment you know because I can't get right underneath to actually see what's going on so I don't really know if anything's broken there or not so I'm just going to leave that for the time being um, you know uh, like I said I've resoldered it so hopefully it'll be all okay now um, and I've also uh, cleaned up the board a little bit and it's basically ready to go back into the actual uh, front panel bezel itself. Um, the bezel itself, uh, like I said, was actually took a bit of hit on one of the BNCs at this end here. So what I actually did was I've actually laid it flat on the workbench with a couple of uh, aluminium plates, top and bottom, without, I took off the BNC connector and basically sandwiched it between two plates of metal and hammered it until it was now completely flat. Just a word of warning to anyone else who thinks they want to do the same thing, the last thing you should be doing is applying a hammer directly onto the actual metal work of the, the piece you're trying to straighten. Um, it's just going to leave marks and leave indentations, it's not going to hammer it flat. So what you do is you put a bit of metal underneath, you put a bit of metal on the top and then you hammer it down that way and it's uh, the best way to get it flat. So I've more or less got it uh, as flat as it needs to be. I've also straightened up the pillars here, they were a little bit twisted as well. Um, so I've straightened them up as best as I can be and uh, uh, basically the PCBs I think is now ready to go back in. Oh the other thing I did was I actually cleaned up the uh, bezels here for the LEDs. Um, like I said, there was that, that film that was basically stuck in the front that had hardened and, and gone steadfast onto the, the actual uh, um, green uh, see-through part there itself. So I cleaned that up. I actually had to take a scalpel actually and scrape away. It wasn't coming off with any of the um, you know the, the solvents I was using. I didn't really want to take acetone to it because this is the whole top half here is actually plastic really so I don't know how that was going to be affected so I basically took a scalpel and scraped it off as best I can be. I've left a few marks but uh, it's a lot lot better than it was um, basically I've cleaned up a solvent over the top of that so for the most part you know looking at it it's it's not too bad um, you know it's a lot better than what it was I think if I wanted to do anything better I'd probably need to cut out that uh, uh, whole section there and then possibly you know glue a new uh, section in place so I'll do that if I need to but at the moment I don't think I'll need to do that so uh, you can see a bit of reflection there you can see the, the basically um, where I've been scraping and there's still some residue on there so maybe a little bit more solvent it might get rid of some of that marks there but uh, for the for the most part you know as you can see there it's it's going to be a lot better than what it was so next step is to put the PCB back in place and see how the switches are uh, sitting and then offer it back up to the, the main electronics and uh, let's see what sort of operation we're getting. Okay, that's the front panel bolted back up just temporarily with the headers in place. I haven't soldered up the BNCs yet. I just want to see how the push buttons and uh, the displays operate. So we'll just put on power here and watch it boot up. And there we go, and then if I just uh, start going along the push buttons, we'll see how they operate. So that one seems okay. I'm wiggling the header now. It doesn't seem to be operating that switch like it was, so that's looking good. That's okay. That one's working. 
button down, enter. That's working. So it's basically just a case of going along all the push buttons, making sure that they're working. Which they do seem to. So that's that channel working. So now I now want the second channel. Down the way. Up, up the way. Enter. Yep. Invert. There's a little bit of leakage. Um, I notice on uh, these ones here from the LED basically leaking onto the next one there. Um, I'm not sure there's much I can do about that really. Um, I suppose one way around it is on each individual LED I could put black tape around each LED itself so there's no side leakage on there. So I might take a look at that again just to improve the functionality there. Um, obviously these ones aren't so much of a problem because they're spaced a little bit further apart but certainly they're getting some leakage in that one's there so they will probably be able, be able to improve that and that one's working and yep all the buttons are actually let's go zoom out a bit so all the buttons are actually operating they're all doing something so I think it's safe to say that the the push buttons are, are uh, definitely um, working and the LEDs are a lot lot better now than what they were before um, they're very very readable now there's none of that uh, um, mess that was on the front of them anymore so definitely it's, you hardly notice at all in fact it's certainly not in video but in real life you can't really see any of the residue or the markings that I've made on the front there so that's looking good so so far so good okay the front panels assembled back on permanently now and I've actually gone ahead and done some cleanup on uh, some of the parts that were corroded for instance the top of the transformer here and if I just turn it around here you can see that the screws are now I removed the screws and basically buffed them down gave them a good clean up before I put them back in same with the fan screws and the uh, the the, the hex nuts on the back of the uh, 488 port and the RS232 port there, took them off and buffed them down, cleaned up the connectors as well there and then on the other side, if I just turn it over, you can see that the transformer's got a bit of a clean up there as well, still stained a little bit but that's well ingrained uh, corrosion and just uh, basically the darkening of the metal there so basically I've given that as big a clean up as I can possibly give it. Uh, there and uh, obviously everything else. Even this, there's a small screw in the side of the um, uh, the housing there for basically mounting a cable saddle for the ribbon cables underneath there. Even that got a clean up. So in terms of the main unit, that's about as much as it's going to get. Um, it's basically already waiting for the actual front panel and the uh, the front bezel and the uh, basically the top and bottom casings which are they're going to take a bit of uh, additional work to get that uh, all knocked into shape and here's the metal work the front bezel I've taken out the twist that was on it and I've given it a light rub down ahead of paint uh, as you can see there I got rid of most of the rust there so the corrosion so that's ready for paint uh, this is the bottom cover I've taken off the legs there and I've got rid of most of the corrosion you can see there's still a little bit down there that was uh, basically from the bottom of the transformer so that's still a little bit of rubbing down to do I've taken out a couple of dents that were in here as well so it's now looking pretty good ready for almost ready for paint and this was the worst one this was the top cover as you remember had the great big uh, dent in this corner here and as you can see it's uh, it's basically pretty good there. I managed to take out the dents there and square up the 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 the, the edges there uh, for the most part. So that's just in need of a, a rub down now and a, a bit of paint, as you can see. Um, but you know, back up to the main unit. Like I said, it's uh, just waiting now on the covers going on. And I think I'll what I'll do is I'll uh, leave the painting and uh, the final reassembly. Uh, for a second video um, because I'm planning on doing a video uh, going through the functionality of the actual uh, SR650 and actually getting it up, hooked up to the scope and the signal generators and etc uh, to see to see if it actually works you know after all this trouble to clean it up and straighten it out that you know still got to see if it actually works so uh, check back later for the second half